All right, hello everybody. This is James Stanley with Daily Effects. Just wanted to do a quick sound check. So if you can hear my voice, please type in why. Please type in why if my voice is coming through. As soon as we get confirmation on audiovisual, we'll get this thing started. All right, awesome, Cornel. Very good to have you in the room, uh, Peter, Andy, Foyce, Saul. Okay, awesome. It looks like we're good to go on the AV front. And just want to say thank you very, very much to everybody in advance for your time. I will do my absolute best to uh, extract proper value of each and every second. Um, today we're going to talk about what to watch for until the end of the year. Uh, we are, of course, going to look at some USD price action setups, but given the fact that we've had not too many material changes in the underlying foundation for markets over the past, say, week, this is a great opportunity to take a step back and look at what else might be coming around the corner. Um, so, as usual, we have a lot to talk about today, but this session is all about you. Type in any trading-related questions that you have. When we get to the Q&A portion of the webinar, I will do my absolute best to knock out each and every one of those while we're here on the live feed. I uh, might not be able to get to all of them, and if I'm not, that's okay. You can ask me on Twitter. I'll do my absolute best to get back with you. Uh, before we get to the charts, I need to go through a couple of quick risk disclaimers. I'm going to leave each up for just about 15 seconds. Then we'll get to the chart, and then we'll start getting our hands dirty with some of these themes. Uh, so without further ado, risk disclaimer. Part one, trading is risky. You didn't know that. I'm gonna leave this up for about 15 seconds, then we'll move on and we'll look at the second disclaimer. Already, time for disclaimer two, the hypothetical trading disclaimer. We're gonna look at some past trades, gonna look at some strategy. Anytime we have to do that, we have to know past performance not indicative of future results. Future is a very uncertain thing. In just about another five more seconds. All right, and there we have it. Uh, all right, so my friend Foysal is asking a great question right up front, so I figure this is a great way to get the session started with uh, with Foysal's question here. Uh, hey James, I was expecting some weakness this week, so I was going to buy dollars. I was going to go long, but we've had no weakness. So this is an excellent, excellent point. I think this is one of the more attractive parts of price action to me. Uh, in markets, there's very little that's actually black and white. There's a lot of grayscale. And price action doesn't purport to tell you what's going to happen. It just tries to give you the most accurate depiction of what is happening or has happened so that you could see that grayscale. You know, and here's an example. I taught trading for a long time. Uh, and one of the parts of teaching trading, I built a lot of systems, a lot of algorithms to try to see which indicators might work best, stuff like that. But when doing so, when I'm building an algorithm or when I'm building a, a, an automated system, I can't just say when the trend is up by, because an algorithm is stupid. What is it going to use to classify that the trend is up? So often we'll go down to one of these, like a moving average, right? So like a 200 period moving average can help to delineate when that trend is up. But the big question is, is any time the prices are above the 200 bullish? And is any time prices are below the 200, is that bearish? No. It misses some of the message because it's all black and white. There's no opportunity for gray area. Now with price action, I could simply say, once we popped above this high right here, I could say, all right, well, we previously had an element of resistance here, meaning that this is where sellers had come in to slam the move. Now, not only have we crossed that level, we're continuing to drive higher. And then when we subsequently come down to test that prior zone of resistance as support, buyers wouldn't even wait. They jumped in and prices continued running higher. Now this uptrend in the dollar has gotten really very strong. Uh, if we look at this on something say like the Japanese yen, there's been very little quiet here. Very, very little quiet. And you can see how excited investors, markets, traders have been by how aggressively they've been buying this uptrend. Okay, if we go back to like say, you know, just a regular normal market, notice that we could often get multiple tests of a support level or a resistance level. But when there's a bias in a market, when you know there's good news that's priced in and then getting further priced in and traders are getting excited about buying, we won't even get tests of those prior resistance levels, right? So notice how we had this first top side break here. Right around the US presidential election, we saw this, uh, this quick amount of selling, right around 106. 
And then you see where buyers came right back in about 100 pips lower, defending that 105 level. Okay. But it's this next top side burst here that runs up to about 107. And then when we get the swing low, notice that buyers, they didn't even want to wait for a test of 106, right? Just uh, put yourself in that, that position. Imagine that you're looking at the chart slide down after a recent topside break, and you know you want to get long, right? You know you want to get long. If you're really bullish, you're probably not going to wait for prices to come down and test these deeper levels. You're probably going to take on a opinion saying, well, you know what? I know I want to buy it down here, but I'm afraid that I'm going to miss it. So that FOMO is so great that I'm going to go ahead and jump in. I'll use a wider stop. But the collective results is that we don't get to test that prior resistance level. So this is a good example of when a market is really frothy. And then notice this resistance swing here had no test whatsoever, right? Markets bubble higher. Prices come down. And buyers, they weren't even willing to wait to get close to that prior point of resistance, right? They just jumped back in really quick, 107.76. They didn't even want to wait around for 107. And that's how we get these series of higher highs and higher lows. This, in my opinion, is why price action is one of the few friends that traders have. Because there's no BS. It just is what it is. Now, what we have now is very interesting for Foysal's goals. Foysal wants to buy the U.S. dollar on a dip. That makes a lot of sense to me. It makes a ton of sense to me. Because you don't want to chase this thing. At that point, it's going to be too expensive to manage your risk. On the converse, you don't want to be so prudent is that you're not looking to buy dips because then the only time you're really going to be looking to buy is when you're playing a reversal situation and a possible trend reversal. Also, pretty gnarly way of going about it. So what we have here in the U.S. dollar could be emblematic of something that could produce a slightly deeper drive. So I had written this up this morning. Give me a quick second. I'll uh, add in a link here. All right, now this is a little bit bigger picture type of stuff, but very relevant to the setup that we're discussing now. And so the U.S. dollar had begun to form into this bull flag formation, okay? Now, bull flag, because we've had a strong bullish move, a series of strong bullish moves uh, after the presidential election right here. So initially, when we had this bounce in the presidential election. It was, it was one of those things that was really non-convincing. But then, you know, as we had this deeper drive, these higher lows that didn't even test prior points of resistance, I mean, the chart was just flying. As, as, this, as this got more and more ingrained in markets, it's become more of an, ex, an expectation. It's become, you know, more of a given, if you will. So on Friday, we burst up to this fresh high. And this is, you know, 13-year highs here on DXY. And to open the week... Notice how this has been channeling lower. Now, what is going on here? I want you to think about the dynamics that are driving behaviors at this point in time. The dollar had just ripped up to a fresh 13-year high right here. Now, is that bearish? I don't think so. In my opinion, this is one of the more bullish things we'd be able to see. A strong breakout is continuing to remain supported above prior points of resistance while this market runs to fresh 13-year highs. This, to me, is a really bullish type of thing. And I think most people would agree. Go down to the weekly chart. This makes sense as well. First up to the high. Notice how we're now catching support. I mean, even above these prior points of resistance, right? So again, this market's still excited, still bullish. Now, let's go down to the daily. Well, now it kind of makes a little more sense as to why we could see a bit of selling here. We've just seen a 5% move in the dollar in like not even two weeks. It was the Tuesday before last that we had this reversal around U.S. presidential election. That's 5.4%. So with prices running up to fresh 13-year highs, 5.4% run, this is one of those environments where it could be tough to elicit new buyers unless there's a motivator. And that's what I wanted to talk about today. What's the next motivator? What's the next driver? And to get to that, we need to kind of look at what goes or has went into this move. So why did markets collapse initially when Donald Trump pulled ahead in the polls on election night? I'm of the opinion that markets put in a semi-collapse because they were afraid of uncertainty. 
especially here in the U.S. dollar. Markets have been bidding this higher in anticipation of an eventual rate hike in December. Now, when the FBI reopened their investigation into Secretary Clinton's emails, thereby giving Donald Trump a higher probability of winning the election, we noticed the week in front of the election, the dollar sold off, stock sold off, and it seemed like it was a Trump-based theme. As in markets were selling off dollars, they were selling off stocks for fear that Donald Trump was going to win based on this new information. Now the next weekend, the FBI spoke again and said, yeah, we're not going to do anything else. Reopening the investigation, no big deal. And so we saw two days of strength in the dollar as we worked higher. And again, this seemed as though it was the reinsertion of certainty after this, after this, this, uh, this, this Donald Trump run that equated to some dollar weakness. But on election night, as the polls began to come in, as Mr. Trump began to show uh, far stronger results than what many were expecting, the dollar started to collapse in a very threatening manner. Notice right here, we had like four hours of downside run that was aggressive. But then, around midnight Eastern, we saw buyers come in. Why would that happen? Well, sure. We had this new insertion of a, sh of a bout of uncertainty with the Donald Trump presidency, but does that mean that the Fed's going to do more QE? Maybe, maybe not, but after four hours of downside run, the dollar had gotten incredibly cheap, and then Donald Trump made a speech talking about fiscal stimulus, giving the idea that maybe there's another way of trying to stimulate the economy without necessarily having to use central bank monetary programs. So that's begun to bring some strength back into the dollar. And then before you know it, the whole fear trade around Trump has turned into this like euphoria. Fast forward two weeks, another 5.4%. And at this point, we're beginning to ask ourselves questions. Okay, great. We're done with the election. We're through that risk. Now we can move forward, look at the new risks around the corner, like the Fed. But Donald Trump isn't going to be inaugurated for another two months. His policies aren't going to come into effect for a long time. And markets are very short-term types of beasts. So as we made those new 13-year highs, reality has begun to set in. That as we go into December, for a rate hike that pretty much everybody in the world is expecting, odds as of this morning were about 100%, for that December hike. Now the big question is, what is the Fed going to do in 2017 and 2018? They're currently expecting two hikes next year. If they move that up to three, then we're probably going to see an extension in this dollar move. Now what makes that a likelihood is the fact that stocks are continuing to trade near all-time highs as well. And over the past couple of years, we've seen the Fed have a tendency to mold monetary policy based on what's happening in equity markets on a very short-term basis. So as we go into this December Fed meeting, if stocks are still trading near all-time highs, this is an opportunity for the Fed to move a little bit deeper on that prospect of normalization, which could bring the dollar higher. And I think, speaking to Foy Saul's question, this is one of the reasons that we're continuing to see really aggressive bids at these higher lows. Because there's not many other areas where traders can expect strength in a currency. If we look at Europe, I mean, many are expecting them, the ECB, to extend QE here in a couple of weeks. Not even a couple of weeks, two weeks. Japan, well, the yen's weakening massively on the idea that the BOJ could buy as many bonds as they want. So you look around the world and there's not a lot of places for capital to flow, there's not a lot of central banks that are looking at higher rates. One of the few is right here, US, Fed, and the US dollar. So I think we're gonna see this bid continue to get relatively decent support as we move in towards that December meeting. Now the converse of that is that eventually, as we do get towards that December meeting, uh, if the Fed does increase that expectation for next year, uh, to three hikes, then I'm of the expectation that we're going to see some element of softness in stocks. I don't know if it's going to be the, to, the, to the degree of the spill that we saw on election night when the S&P fell from like 2150 down to 2030. 
And since then, it's rallied by another 8.6%. I don't know that it's going to be that deep. But we can see multiple iterations of this in the very recent past where the Fed ramping up hawkishness or simply getting less dovish has brought upon weakness across equity classes. Now, this is the taper tantrum in 2014. That was offset because Bill Dudley of the New York Fed said, just because we're tapering QE, it doesn't mean we have to hike. A year later, we have the Chinese equity spill in August. Remember, markets were fully expecting a rate hike in September. Chinese markets collapsed in early August. Right here, Will Dudley, New York Fed, same thing. Guys, we don't have to hike in September. It's not a given. Fed doesn't hike in September, but they say it's coming in December and the markets sell off again, then the Fed gets dovish. This is the interesting part. This is where the Fed actually hiked rates, December 17th of last year. And notice that the S&P set a high on December 17th. It was touched two weeks later ahead of a pretty major equity spill. And that's how we opened the new year. How do you think that we reverse from there? Fed went dovish again. Brexit, BOE went super dovish. And then here at election night, election night this thing didn't even drive. Buyers jumped in before it could even close. So you could kind of see the operand conditioning here from this to this to this to this to this. Notice how these retracements are getting more shallow progressively faster, quicker, more aggressive. Well, this to me is the illustration of how market expectations around central bank behavior have gotten more and more aggressive. Because back here, we had the simple fear that the end of QE meant higher rates. And then here, we had the fear that the Fed was still going to hike in September, even with Chinese markets showing weakness. The fear here was the Fed was going to tighten too quickly. Notice we got that extension. Here on Brexit, we have like a couple of days of pain. And then on election nights, not even a full day of pain. Markets have come to expect that the central banks and the Fed is going to continue supporting the risk trade. But they're going to have to make a choice. Either they support the risk trade and let the dollar move down, or they support the prospect of normalization and they let stocks soften. And I have setups on either side of that. Now, on the normalization trade, I still like dollar yen. Um, additional upside here. Now, Foisal said, yeah, I was looking um, Aussie short, dollar yen long. So this is the one that I've been picking on now for a couple of months. These types of moves can be really difficult to try to time, and this is a good reason as to why. It took me a couple of months for the move to actually materialize, and I had to set through quite a bit of grind down here in your support while that was happening. But this is often how we'll see trends change. It won't usually be on the turn of a dime. We will have some kind of type of bias, bring prices down to a long-term support level like 100 here on dollar yen. It'll churn for a while. And then eventually either buyers or sellers are gonna win out and it's gonna pick its next direction. At this point, we've just rallied back up to May highs. Right here, May 30th. And 111.618 clean Fibonacci level could be a pretty big level of resistance. This is simply the 50 fib, like the 18 year move on the pair. Notice that 50 fib right here, 111.61. Go down on the daily and we can see where this had given a swing low support back in February of this year. Now we're right back up. So. With this type of move, this fast, and with these two daily candles printing right here, I would not want to chase this based solely on the composition of this long-term daily chart. right? Because you can almost see the price action siphoning off some of that buying support, some of that buying drive. right? We just rallied up to a new high. We get this doji spinning top-ish like candle. Good element of, uh, of indecision. But the fact that we're getting even more indecision shows that buying and selling pressure, at least in this daily chart, is roughly equalized. Okay, So still bullish, 
because if there weren't bulls continuing to come in to support the trade, then sellers would have taken it right back down and we would have had to test one of these deeper support levels. A level like 110 is just screaming out to me right now if I could get support there. Let's go down a little bit tighter to see how we can time this thing. All right, four hour chart. Here's where you could see that buyer excitement in these bids, right? They're not even waiting for deeper tests of some of these support levels. As a trader, you have two not great options here. Either you rush the entry and you take a wider stop, or you wait and you let that FOMO work, that fear of missing out, meaning the pair might just bubble higher without you being able to catch an entry. At which point you could then wait for a retracement and trade maybe like a cleaner type of trend-based setup. But all that we know now is the buying and selling pressure is roughly equalized after a really major bull move. So to me, I still carry a bullish connotation with this, but I'm either going to have to hustle my, my uh, top side long entries a little bit quicker, accepting the fact that I'm going to need slightly wider stops because I'm not going to be able to get these support tests of prior resistance points, or I let the move break resistance and then I wait to buy support at or around prior resistance. Like I said, a series of not great options. Now, I know a lot of folks are going to look at this and they're going to say, well, if I don't expect it to keep going up, I'm going to want to go short. I think that's a really bad way of looking at things because as a trader, it's your pickiness, your selectivity that is often going to amount to success. Just because I don't want to be long in a market doesn't mean that I have to be short. I still like this long, but I don't like the probabilities of trying to get long right now while we're at resistance. In essence, trading a breakout for a long-term chart with a really, really short-term chart. If I'm entering right now, this is the swing that's gonna get my attention, 109.79, it gets me below the 110 level. I could also dig it a little bit deeper to get inside of this quick little resistance swing, like 109.60. Now, as of right now, that's like 145 pips of risk whilst at resistance, ahead of a US holiday. Not my thing. But if holiday trading can allow this to trickle down a little bit deeper, maybe some profit taking. And maybe some folks do try to take a short off of this little point of resistance up here at 111.35. But this is where we get to be picky. This is where we get to wait to see if we get that better, more attractive topside entry. All right, like you see down here, level like 108.50. Fairly clean point of support here, prior point of resistance here. If I get price a little bit deeper, that's a long entry. I want to see price get deeper and actually find support. Right? I want to see the wick indicating the buyers are in fact reacting to that level. Price hitting that is not enough in isolation. Let's get this one up here too. Use that. I'm going to call it like 109.617. Getting those two little swings with this a little bit deeper. And that's a poor swing. All right, but what if the US dollar doesn't continue to run higher, right? This is just one scenario. This is the scenario where we walk into December, Fed gets hawkish, um, meaning they upgrade that forecast for next year to like maybe three hikes from the prior two. And remember, this is what had helped collapse things at the beginning of this year. The Fed hiked in December, then they also said four hikes in 2016, shocked everybody. Everybody said, well, hey, we just fought all year for one. Now you want to do four? You know, combine that with China, combine that with oil. Not a great s series of s scenarios, right? So what if the Fed's learned from that? What if the Fed comes into this and they say, you know what? We're not going to commit to anything additional here. We're going to hike, and we'll play it by ear. That could be dollar weakness. If we get dollar weakness, I think there's a few interesting places to be. This is one that I'm plotting right now. We're trying to. And this is a good example of where I'm trying to implement a bearish stance on a, uh, oh, excuse me, a bullish stance on a bearish setup. So in this four-hour chart, I think you can see it fairly clearly where Kiwi is looking as though it's getting at least a bit more bearish. We have this trend line. We have this support zone. Notice the way that the price action worked with this trend line. We caused some support on the way down. It tried to stop. Sellers, too strong. We run down. We test 70 support, which we hadn't been at for a few months. 
prices run back and now we have that lower high off the projection of that trend line okay so at this stage of this four-hour chart this is still a bearish scenario this is not something that I want to buy yet but if the support could begin to build ie indicating that we have some element of resistance showing in the US dollar fantastic this is where I could start to look at a longer term reversal theme to play dollar weakness while the dollar is at or near highs at the core of that approach is going to be the 70 level of support because notice how they did a pretty good job of catching the lows just uh, to end last week and you guys know the zone 69.50 to 70.50 we've been talking about this for quite a while it was a prior zone of resistance here back in May it's come in as a really strong zone of support since June we've had multiple tests in the zone each time we've had a Kiwi bounce you know, a lot of folks wouldn't be seeing that head and shoulders not looking to trade the head and shoulders here not a big fan of head and shoulders patterns but here's what I could do to try to get this set up in a more bullish type of deal if I go down to the hourly chart you can see where that 70 low came in after 70 came in notice that we burst up to a quick higher high right here and then we caught another point of support off 70 and a half another higher high now the subsequent retest of 70 and a half has not held yet but all that I care about at this point is this little swing low right in here if I could get a swing low above this level as in if prices can burst up to set a new higher high above 7086 then using this hourly chart I could make the case do we have now a series of higher highs higher lows and higher highs if I could get that to burst above that high then I could look to buy it and I already have my higher low point of support now to make that work I need to see a higher high first because notice as we burst up here on the Kiwi sellers came in pretty quickly they weren't having much of that not only that when we came back down buyers couldn't defend 7050 we started to wedge a little bit deeper right so at this stage price action for the reversal theme is not looking too bright but until this low is taken out the prospect is still there and it kind of goes to what I was speaking about a little earlier to we saw right he's trying to time um, a top side dollar entry by buying support well, sometimes we can't time it that perfectly we just have to set up the scenario and we have to wait for price action to meet that scenario and if it doesn't we just simply next it and look at something else like dollar cad you see a lot of you a lot of you folks want to see dollar cad here uh, I got a setup on that before we get there I want to go through one more dollar weakness scenario okay so another possible dollar weakness scenario uh, here in the cable this one isn't looking great right now but the intermediate term setup is still there so while the dollar has been making 13 year highs pretty much all week Gable is still working on lower highs after we had that quick flash crash move after we had that uh, you know couple of weeks at historically weak levels we got a pretty big level here on the cable it's this 23 and a quarter level now why 23 and a quarter I don't know that's just what price action showing here's the flash crash move after the flash crash we had this quick run higher okay so here's an, kind of another learning point you know we talked a little bit earlier I wanted you to imagine the way the price action uh, was moving on dollar yen whilst near highs well imagine the same thing while we're down here on pound dollar at lows you guys probably remember this it was just about a month ago remember after the flash 23 down to 2085 who's buying this I mean, maybe a few retail traders but you know can you imagine a lot of banks with big money saying oh, I gotta buy some cable now it's down to 120 from 145 a few months ago probably not many people are looking to jump back in with long cable positions here right no but there are a lot of people that have short positions as indicated by the move lower if they want to close that short position they're gonna need to buy buying to cover so the same thing as buying to open a new position and the fact that it brings in demand to a market that's what gives us this quick topside move higher but where's the you think sellers re-entered right here 23 and a quarter as indicated by the price action swing high 
come down, we set this nice little form of support. Went back to 23 and a quarter, and where do you think sellers re-entered? Same place. Get back to 23 and a quarter, and what do you think happened? Sellers tried, then the BOE increased their inflation projections for next year. Since the BOE has done that, notice how the cable has continued to remain supported above that 23 and a quarter level that had prior to, uh, previously been in resistance. There's a very valid reason for why this may continue to happen as well. Again, after the presidential election on the 9th, the dollar has just been surging against most currencies. Like we saw that near 1,000 pip run against the yen, right? Euros down near annual lows. The dollar is strong everywhere, but here on the cable, it pretty much has just been in a range-bound type of mode with support continuing to show around this 23 and a quarter to 2370 zone. So if we are in one of those scenarios where the Fed is not going to go hawkish or more hawkish in their December dot plot matrix, I mean, the expectation that we'd see some element of dollar weakness to go along with equity strength or continuation of equity strength. And if we do see dollar weakness, I think this could be one of the more attractive areas to play it here against the British pound after it's been just absolutely beaten down in 2016 around fear on the Brexit referendum. Now, I'm not saying what's going to happen around Brexit because I don't know and I don't think anybody else does either. But this is one of those areas that could present a potential edge to a trader. And the fact that most human beings panic and if a trader can keep a cool head, that's automatically an edge. Let me show you what I'm talking about. If we go back to the whole Brexit topic, it's very similar to U.S. presidential elections and the fact that much of the world thought they knew what was going to happen, didn't end up happening, then they had to scramble, and everything ended up being okay. But if you look at the way that this thing moved around that whole theme, around the Brexit discussions, we had this gigantic move lower here on June 20th, and this is after Sterling had already been punished for much of 2016. 2016 was not friendly to the British pound. Brexit did not help. What was interesting, though, is that right after Brexit, like if you guys remember the way that Brexit happened, the referendum came through, uh, vote was on a Thursday, we knew on a Friday, 623 was the vote, 624 is when everybody found out about it. It's kind of like the Trump presidency, right? All that we knew at this point was what voters had decided. We don't know what that was going to entail, what it was going to bring, what the actual impact was going to be. We saw a lot of folks trying to guess. Right Now, the first initial reaction here on Sterling around uh, Brexit, of course, was fear, uncertainty, much like we saw on the night of the election with Donald Trump. The given status quo had been unsettled. And so we, of course, saw some risk aversion from folks that were scared. But that's Monday after Brexit. Tuesday, Wednesday, prices were beginning to work back. And that, and that made a lot of sense, at least to me, because we had put in a big move here around Brexit, but we didn't really know what it entailed yet. All that we knew was that you know something had changed in the political constituency of the UK to the EU. That's it. And we didn't know what it was going to entail, what it was going to bring, uh, any of that stuff. So to me, it was very rational for Sterling to move a little bit deeper on the chart, maybe even come back towards this 140 level to test some of these prior support points and at the very least just for some of these short positions to close up risk right but what ended up happening is just two days after that low had, set, had been set Wednesday of the following week Mark Carney came out and said hey guys Brexit is really bad I told you it was going to be bad I told you we were going to get a sharp repricing in the value of the British pound and we still don't know what it's going to do because we don't know when Article 50 is going to be triggered. We don't even know who's going to trigger it. Because at this point, we did not have Theresa May yet. We just knew that Mr. Cameron was gone. But he said, in spite of all this, we're going to cut rates. We're going to head this Brexit risk off head on. So what do you think that did? To any of those folks that were thinking about closing up their short sterling positions to try to protect some profits, uh -uh. hold on for a deeper move. And then it even got more folks to sell as indicated by the fact that we had deeper drive down here on the chart, set this low at like 127.80. And after this, I mean, this thing was just, I mean, it was just beaten down, right, to the point where anybody that did want to sell already had sold. 
and there is very little additional selling pressure that could drive this thing lower. And you could, as indicated by the fact that there was nothing bullish happening here at the time, yet we happened, uh, we continued to see these higher lows, right? Now, is this bullish on the sterling? No, it's just not as bearish from the fact that there's no other sellers that could drive this thing deeper, or at least it weren't at the time. But this is why knowing macro or following macro could be so important because if you have the context of the situation where this is a really bad deal for the UK, really bad deal for the, for, for the, for the British pound, but we're seeing higher lows, so that means selling pressure must be drying up. We're going to need a new motivator to really kick this thing into high gear if we do want to take out those lows. Well, that motivator happened just a couple weeks later when discussions of hard Brexit came about. And so you're taking this thing that's already really very weak and you're throwing it down into the nether regions where it's only spent like three months out of its entire life. And I'm talking about pricing, I think it's like sub 120 here on the British pound. Now at that point, who else is left to sell? And then who's going to come in and sell near historically weak levels? Probably not very many folks. And so that's what allows this range to develop. Near these lows, buying and selling pressure is roughly equidistant. But the BOE, they already shot their cannon. So when inflationary pressure began to show, and when they had to admit it, then we had even more reason for these long-term short positions to cover up for fear of a deeper move. And now there's actually a case to be made for buying sterling, as I went over a little bit earlier, in a short USD type of scenario. And this is how we can see sentiment change. And this is where the relationship between sentiment, price action, and, and macro all converge. It's like I always say with, uh, in terms of analysis, if it can move it, I want to use it. Whether it's macro price action, I mean, if it's a 200 DMA, I'll keep that on there too. I don't really care. End of the day, it's just about trying to get better entries. Okay, I've got a lot of questions here on Dollar Cat, and I've been meaning to get back to this one, so let's go ahead and kick, that, uh, kick off the Q&A with that. <clears throat> okay, so this is one that I've been stalking for a while. Um, more interestingly, since the early portion of October, after we had that, that pivot at the Bank of Canada, uh, and I got an article here for you if you do want to read a little bit more behind that macro scenario. Uh, right in here. And there's a couple of good links as well in this article if you want some, a little bit of background like that one and those three. So what excites me about this one, especially for a dollar strength type of scenario, is you know if we're going to look for elongated trends, what we really want to see is divergent monetary policy or divergent stances from the representative central banks. And I think dollar CAD has that potential behind it, especially in a long USD hawkish Fed type of scenario, right? Where I get a little bit more scared of this setup is, is if the Fed does find a way to back down. Because at that point, we're looking at a less hawkish Fed, and still a relatively dovish BOC, but there's not a super concerted driver there. But with the backdrop that we have now, with the expectation for the Fed to stay hawkish, maybe even get a little bit more hawkish, I think this one could continue to shine. So at issue here is this move right here. That's the outlier. This was the Bank of Canada meeting in October, um, just about a month ago. i got to kind of give you the backstory. I'll try to run through it real quick. So CAD's weakening massively against a really strong U.S. dollar as the Fed walks towards more and more and more rate hikes, right? Well, right around January, we saw a pretty important pivot. Uh, myself, Chris Vecchio, we wrote an article about this topic. We said, uh, CAD, oil, these things are at a turning point. That was uh, January 29th, right after the highs had come in. And the juxtaposition behind this one was just that it was a, a stupid risk-reward ratio on both dollar CAD and, and oil, so it didn't make sense to try to try to chase those trends, dollar cat higher or lower. But we knew that there was a pivot in policy, right? As in, the Bank of Canada had been extremely dovish while the Fed had been extremely hawkish. And that's what had led into this really rigid topside move. So, I mean, we're talking about from the beginning of December, from 134 
to the middle of January when we were at 146 and change. It's a gigantic move in a cross-border currency because there's a lot of trade that goes on between the United States and Canada. There's a lot of Canadians that come into the U.S., Americans that go into Canada. That, 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 that differential exchange rate in you know, two months is shocking. So Stephen Polos knew that something needed to change. And it was right around here, it was uh, right around mid-January, when Mr. Polos at, at the Bank of Canada meeting in January said, Canadian voters have just elected Justin Trudeau. Justin Trudeau's campaign was very much built upon the premise of fiscal stimulus. So we're going to take a back seat here at the Bank of Canada. We're going to let Mr. Trudeau do his job. Well, we're going to let him implement this fiscal stimulus. And then we're going to evaluate, then we're going to play by ear. So that led to a near immediate move of CAD strength. That CAD strength came in a really bad time for Canada. Because as the Canadian dollar was strengthening, oil was recovering, which would normally be a good thing for Canada. But because the Canadian dollar was strengthening deeper and deeper and deeper, Canada didn't get a lot of that benefit. To the point where through this channel, Canada developed and produced some of the worst export numbers in its history, largely because of the really strong CAD. So after this move, the realization kind of came out, hey, Mr. Trudeau's, you know, he's, he's got good intentions here. You know, he's trying to do the right thing. But the measures he's rolled out are very small compared to what the Bank of Canada was doing and, and what the Canadian economy might need. So we, we kind of saw the build-in of expectation for the Bank of Canada to do more monetary stimulus, as indicated by this, you know, slight bias of weakness in the CAD. Now, in October... We had an article saying, you know, basically it's just a matter of time before uh, BOC gets more dovish. And we're in essence looking for that dovishness to be transmitted via the Bank of Canada's monetary policy report. It's their inflation expectations. And so, you know, we went into this meeting trying to read the tea leaves to get an idea for how close the BOC might be to some monetary stimulus. What ended up happening was just amazing, though. Mr. Polo's in the middle of his press conference straight up said, well, we discussed monetary stimulus, which is kind of like a bing, bing, bing. We don't have to read the tea leaves anymore. The man himself just said it. And so near immediately we saw a reversal here in Dollar Cad. Dollar Cad had previously tested the 130 level. After BOC began to weaken, 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 and since then, the trend hasn't reversed. We've seen CAD weakness now with dollar strength. Now you can see, and this is very messy, but you can see where dollar CAD is trying to dig in higher low support off a of prior zone of resistance. So this is another one that I have on the long USD side of the ledger. Uh, I'm still long in the pair. Um, I believe it's from about two weeks ago. Might have, uh, might have been three, but been on dollar CAD for a little bit. And I still like this one, um, where I think that this could not work out. And I think, you know, whenever you're setting up one of these uh, macro things, you want to look at, you know, when it might not or, you know, what the downside or what the risk is. I think where this doesn't work out is if is if we see the Fed, you know, stay relatively not hawkish. I don't even want to go as far as saying dovish. I think that's the hard expectation with equity markets so aggressively strong right now. But if the Fed is non-committal to 2017 rate hikes, if they do transmit a bit of dovishness, i.e. equating to dollar weakness, then I think that this is one of the areas where I might play. Uh, support break, you know, if I could get a 130 entry there on the longer term, I still like the setup. Uh, break below 130 obviates the whole, whole bullish idea. All right, so time to go through some uh, additional questions here. <clears throat> Don't hesitate to ask me anything trading related. Okay, so a couple setups here. Um, a short Aussie. Okay, yeah, we had a decent little support break at prior support level, right? And this is working fairly clean with this recent Fibonacci retracement. For this one, I'm taking the January low up to, say, like the April high. The 38.2 of that move, I functioned as decent support. Right, we just fell below that. Uh, if I could get a resistance hit there, it's going to be a fairly clean entry. I want resistance here, and then the stop go above 75, and then I can look for the continuation move lower with a long-term target here at 72. 72 is a big batch of support on, uh, on Aussie. 
but that's what I'd want to be targeting on uh, short side approaches. And this is another long dollar candidate. Um, okay, so what would you look for for uh, swing position setups? It's the same thing, whether it's a swing, whether it's a scalp, whether it's a long-term trade, is the cost worth it, pure and simple. And that's one of the reasons that I'll often, um, you know, kind of like reverse engineer scenarios for myself. Like, for instance, right now, I like the idea of selling Aussie after support break. I don't like the idea of selling it here because this, to me, is not really even resistance yet. It could come in as resistance, but for right now, all that we know is that this is the high of the day. I have no other indication to lead me to believe otherwise. You know, I like this as a theoretical level of resistance, 7450, because we had a prior point of support, Fibonacci level, a couple of different things going on there, even the support back here. But, you know, more to the point, if I get prices up here and showing me some resistance, then the beauty behind that is that I could look to wedge my stop above either that wick or this one, right at 75, and, you know, feasibly play a theme where I'm looking for continuation of that resistance to play it into weakness. But it's always going to be the same thing for me, is the risk worth the reward. I know that's a very general way of looking at it, but I think if you look at markets with a healthy amount of, of cynicism or, or skepticism, you're going to look at it from a pure cost standpoint. You know, it's just like owning a business or, or any business, you know. Um, if you're really big into fashion or you're really big into electronics, I mean, that doesn't mean that you could go out and pay top dollar for PlayStations, resell and expect to make a profit just because you love to play video games. End of the day, it's still business. And, you know, if you can't get those PlayStations at a lower price and you could sell them, well, you're not going to be in business for long. It's kind of the same thing with trading. You know, this stuff is awesome. I love it. I love reading about it. And this is what I do as my hobby. And it's a lot of fun for me. But it doesn't mean I could do it stupidly, you know, or, or haphazardly and expect it to work out just because my passion's there. If anything, it's going to burn even more because my passion's there and now it's not working out for me. So I still need to be prudent, you know, regardless of whether it's a swing, a long-term set, or a scalp. End of the day, if my money's going to be employed, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a decent pulse on what it's going to what it's going to be doing or where it's going to be going or at least try to. Uh, from Kobus, went short dollar yen, just short of uh, 1140. Any thoughts? So I got a couple of friends that are big counter trend traders, and I'm definitely not going to knock it because at the end of the day, it's your account, my friend. You know, as, as long as you feel good about it, that's all that matters. But it's just not my cup of tea, and the reason for that is because it goes back to that cynicism, skepticism type of thing that I was talking about a moment ago, where I literally have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow, and I embrace that. I don't deny it. I don't try to run from it. I embrace it. I don't know what in the world is going to happen tomorrow. That's what makes life great. So it's exciting. It's not predictable. It also makes trading difficult, right? Because our job is to essentially forecast future price flows. So to me, I try to keep it simple. Look for a way where I could risk a dollar to make two. And then, you know, the idea of where I might be able to do that roots from analysis. And in my opinion, from there, it's, the, you know, the simpler, the better. You know, something like price action is pretty simple because, well, if we're making higher highs and higher lows, buyers are obviously pretty excited. If we at this point of resistance and a bunch of sellers come in, well, then that excitement was a fleeting theme. And the big picture move is lower. So I want to sell that resistance. You know, simple things like that. But, uh, you know, so on that front, I'm, I'm really big when it comes to trend identification. Right, so like if I have something as strong as I have in dollar yen right now, I really only want to be buying or buying only. Yeah, sure, maybe it gets a little bit of wiggle, you know. But if you did get 11.40, which I'm not even seeing on here, I'm seeing 11.358. This could be a bid chart, you know. But I'm not even seeing 11.40 here. But if you did get 11.40, this thing didn't get a lot of run on you. Know, it's already it's already rationing rationing back pretty quickly, you know. Um, it's just you know, the, the banes of trading counter trend. You're going against the grain. You're going against the flow. Now, can a salmon swim upstream? Yeah, sure. It's just the exception and not the rule. And when it comes to analysis, for me, my goal is to get as many probabilities on my side as possible. So if I get support in an uptrend, I'll look to buy it. I'll keep the stop relatively tight. If it doesn't work, take me out. 
but you know one of the dangers of of, uh, of a counter trend scalping strategy is what they call death by a thousand cuts you know you get the stock above the high that's one of the the attractive parts of trading reversal it's because you know where resistance is you put the stop on the other side but it could get triggered pretty quick you know so that even if you're wrong or if you were right you're wrong because you got stopped out um, yeah, so that's one of the reasons that I'm so sticky on the trend. It has nothing to do with, you know, um, you know, with adherence to market conditions or anything like that. No, it's a simple bias question, question for me. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but if there's an uptrend going on, there's probably something good happening. Maybe it continues. I'll give it like a 51% chance that it continues and I'll look to go in that direction. Just my take on the matter. Uh, SEMA, LDHF, my friend. I hope that all is well. Um, Chris Roby says, dollar cad bounces are being sold. So, yeah, I mean, this is one of the important aspects of of uh, perspective, right? You say dollar cad bounces are being sold, but I see dollar cad bounces are being bought. Here off this four-hour chart, go out to the daily, it's going to be a very similar type of thing, right? You see where this real thick zone of resistance built in here at 134. We've had a couple of tests off that, four to be exact, over the past five days, and each one prices have bounced. You know, so uh, to me, it's uh, you know, it, it kind of dials back to being comfortable with a lot of these time frames. Like I'll use the weekly, daily, four-hour, hourly, and then I might dial in on a five minute to try to get an entry. But perspective is a powerful thing because you know. End of the day, this minute chart, this hourly chart, it's just going to be a microcosm of what it is we're looking at on this weekly or this monthly. Um, so yeah, I mean, maybe we're seeing some element of, of uh, bounces being sold on like the hourly chart. Um, yeah, I'm seeing this one, maybe something on a five minute, and maybe a little sell in there. But and even then, this has been a pretty strong bid. Uh, from SEMA, hi James, how do you back test your strategy with the fundamentals? Don't, um, I can't, you know, it's it's too subjective a thing. I think that, so taking a step back, I think that there's, um, I think there's a disconnect in our society today. Um, when I was going through university, you know, right around the year 2000, you know, this is when computers and big data were starting to become a thing. I mean, I remember when I learned Excel um, on, I think it was the Office 2000 program, but I remember when I was learning Excel, you know, I knew how to do a couple of macros on a spreadsheet. I was like a wizard in my in my QBA class, quantitative business analysis, because I was like the only guy that knew macros. And you know, fast forward another ten years, now everybody knows macros. Everybody's using big data. Everybody's you know examining poll numbers. Everybody's a statistician, right? But you know, if we just look <laughs> at, at two of the bigger statistical events of the last year, it should show you how horrible most people are at statistical forecasting. Right, Brexit and Trump, they were both off on those. In reality, you look back, and those polls for both of those instances are ridiculous because you're talking about sample sizes of a thousand people on population bases of, of many million. I think there's like almost 100 million voters in the United States. Most of these sample sizes are a few thousand at max. It's not statistically relevant. Perhaps more to the point, what we found out later is that many of those polled bases were biased. Like here in the United States, some of those, uh, uh, some of the polls were like it was like 80% Democrats that were asked versus 20% Republicans. I mean, that's not a valid representation of the statistical body as a whole. So basically, that poll is not even worth the toilet paper that it might be printed on. But a lot of people have come to accept that statistics are like a given, right? Oh, the numbers say it, so it must be so. No. Not at all. Yes, numbers are accurate if used correctly, but they're not always used correctly, especially in polling and, and statistical sampling. Where this comes home to roost is I think that a lot of folks, especially traders, have a tendency to build a false reliance on backtest and historical sampling. Right? I've produced a lot of algorithms over the last 10 years. Backtests, in my opinion, are garbage because they're highly theoretical. 
the way that you see how strong a strategy is with forward testing. Now, I think what you're asking about SEMA is, you know, where do I get, um, you know, some of the meshing of macro with price action? And that's just observational. It's just spend enough time around markets remembering, oh, well, this happened, and then prices dove, and then we have the reactions. So, okay, maybe that fits in with this. You know, it, it's very, very highly subjective, and there's not really a way to get any quantitative back testing behind that, in my opinion. Um, I think that statistics are a dangerous thing. You know, I, I'm not going to talk against education because education is powerful, but I also think that there's a point where it gets maybe a little bit too theoretical for um, for practical usage. And, and I think false reliance on backtesting is one of those areas where that happens. Just my opinion. Uh, from Sharif, do you still scalp and Ronaldo goes alongside this uh, longer term swing stuff? Yeah, man, that's what my time outside of the office is for. <laughs> um, yeah, I do. Uh, basically, what I'm doing is based on the environment. If it's, you know, like a couple months back, we had some really good momentum, I was scalping most of the time. Um, you know, right now, swings are kind of where it's at for me. When things are really quiet, that's when it's time to polish the algos. Because a lot of the algo stuff that I do is mean reversion range based type of type of uh, type of stuff, or you know, extreme breakouts out of a range, you know, with real tight, real tight trade management. Um, you know, so I, I try to base it off the environment. Um, I don't want to be one of these guys that's always trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. And over the last seven years, while I've been part of Daily Effects, that's been one of my big personal goals is to, you know, add more arrows in the quiver. I've got a couple of things that I feel really good about when it comes to trading. You know, I've had these with me for a while now, but, you know, I love this stuff. So I want to see how deep I can go, how much I can develop, you know, an analytical skill set. At the end of the day, all in the goal of trying to build a better wheel. Um, that's my take. <laughs> Kova says, thank you. Yes, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. And uh, Stephen Long Island, the perfect comment. Uh, absolutely right about the polls oversampling Democrats. So I was pointing out for months. Yeah, and, you know, I think that, and you know, especially with some retrospect, I think that, I think it had a damaging impact, you know? Like, I know as we were going into the election, a lot of folks said, well, yeah, the Democrats want to make it look as though she is a more likely winner. You know, so it makes Trump look worse. Well, okay, yeah, sure. But what does it do to independent voters that are actually thinking about voting for her that might wake up on Tuesday morning in a training and say, yeah, you know what? She's going to win. Why don't you go to the polls? You know, I, so I guess what I'm saying is by, you know, adversely um, – "Quote unquote," massaging the data, <laughs> actually, probably um, created an adverse result to some degree, you know. And that was the part that I didn't get as we went into it, you know. Even if you do show that she's winning by 15 points in these places, you know, we had some news outlets out there that were saying that she has a hundred percent chance of winning. Like, I okay, I get it, <laughs> you know, you got your reasons, but. Statistically speaking, there's very little in this world you want to assign 100% probability to, except, of course, December rate hikes. <laughs> but in a presidential election that has shown a very split majority, um, you know, arguably, it, it, it could actually feed into the narrative. Um, Steve says bad poll numbers. Uh, could also suppress Trump voters. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, especially in some of those, you know, strong red areas. Um, you know, and I noticed this in, in a very interesting way. I grew up in Texas, live in New York, and I was back home uh, early October for my mother's birthday, and you know, talking with some old friends or whatever, and uh, it was the strangest thing. I was driving to see a group of friends in you know, a decent little area in uh, in Austin. Almost every yard I passed had a, had a Trump placard, and you know that was really odd for me because we were deep in the election season. I hadn't seen one at all in New York, not a single one on a single lawn. But then I go down to Texas, and you know every other house has a has a Trump placard, you know. And so I noticed at that point that this was going to be a pretty pretty divisive election. Um, <laughs> right there with you, Steve right there with you. Usually I try to be a little bit more uh, gray area. 
Trish says no lawns in NYC. That's why. Well, man, I'm talking about the burbs, you know, not even in New York City proper, but you know, out, out in, uh, you know, out in Jersey, or you know, even getting up to, uh, you know, like the White Plains area. I wouldn't even see them, see them there. But you go down to Texas, it's every other one, and you know, you go down to Texas, you mention Hillary Clinton's name, and then you get a, you know, very adverse reaction. You come up to New York, you mention Donald Trump's name, a very adverse reaction. Um, you know, I try to be the peacekeeper at a lot of, you know, social gatherings and get-togethers, and, you know, there was a couple of times when I had people coming after me for just trying to stay in the middle, um, you know, so I could tell it was going to be divisive, and I sure as heck knew that we weren't going to have, you know, a 100% probability type of thing, and, you know, it's kind of the same that I knew with or thought around Brexit, so it's turned out to be a pretty good year for me so far. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I do have to cut the time. For those in the United States, I would like to say I hope you have a very, very happy Thanksgiving and a phenomenal rest of the week. Uh, I will be back next week. We have Tuesday's webinar at 1, Thursday's at 2. Really hope you, ladies and gentlemen, can, uh, can join me back. But thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. And as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.